Hello everybody, John Henry, uh, both sides of the conversation. Today we are here in the city with an amazing, amazing legend of our city. Today we're having a conversation, as you all know, we've been working many projects, working on changing the narrative, making sure that everyone's voice in our city is heard and we're hearing from different folks, different backgrounds, different communities. And today we're having a conversation with one of our fearless leaders of the community, one of our elders that's impacted. So today we're having a conversation with Ms. Virginia Marshall. How are you doing, Ms. Marshall? I am doing very well, John. Thank you so much for being here and taking the time to talk with me. Yes, definitely. So, you know, uh, part of this narrative shift and storytelling is really about hearing this perspective of folks who've been here in San Francisco, who's doing work in San Francisco, impact in San Francisco. And you are a pillar of that. Thank you. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is just to start off and have a conversation with you about, um, you know, your time here in San Francisco, the work you have done, educating our young people, being involved in the black community, seeing kind of how the cities develop, mm -hmm. but from your perspective and just kind of take us through those stages of like, mm -hmm. where it's at now and where it was when you first started. Well, whereas now I'm retired, but let me go, let me just go back some, some, a few years. Uh, I lived here in the city for over 40 years in San Francisco. Um, and I came here as a military wife with no children, and we raised three children in San Francisco. Now I have five grandchildren. And last year, I retired from the, from the school district here after 36 years of Stella and drove a service. I enjoyed going to work every day. And from Richard Wilson, which is now Philip Burton, uh, to Galileo, the home of Mayor Breed. Uh, and then I spent my last 13 years in Baby Hunters Point uh, running after school programs and in five different parts of the city. Because I truly believe that the school day does not end, will not end at three o'clock when the bell rings. We must have a comprehensive, great after school programs. And we, and I have, I was blessed to have great site coordinators at Baby and Baby Hunters Point, at Providence Baptist Church, and Ingleside, and, uh, and uh, oh gosh, and uh, Chinatown, and also in uh, one in the Outer Mission that was our largest site. And so we believe that the first hour you do homework because it keeps mom and dad happy. And the second hour we do extensive uh, things to make, keep the students happy, like STEM, STEM, cooking, field trips, uh, sports. Because yes. I, I absolutely believe that we must educate, have a well-rounded student. The student must have great academic skills, be physically fit, yes. mentally alert, and the community all come together. And then I'm also with, I, was, I am president emeritus of the San Francisco Alliance of Black School Educators. We have many programs to uplift our students. And one that I chair for uh, 16 years was the African-American Honor Roll. And we all know that for, I guess, 10 years or so, under the constant decree under Dr. E. Anthony Anderson, the students would gather down the street at Ellie Hutch, at John Muir, and they would march down the street. And if everyone would be out uh, congratulating the children, it was just wonderful. So they did that for about 10 years. And then that because of a lawsuit, the district could no longer have the Honor Roll. So I could, it took me two years to convince my colleagues in the Alliance that we could do it. We had no money, zero, no money. The first year we, it was held at Jones United, three years at Jones United Methodist Church. We served the students Costco cake and punch because that's all we could afford. And then it became too small. And then when we came to Third Baptist Church for another three years, and then it became too small. Then we spent the past 10 years at St. Mary's Cathedral. And I think it was gonna become too small, but then COVID hit. And so for two years, we had it, um, the African American Honor Roll on, um, uh, virtually. And it's a signature event because is you see a whole church full of happy faces. Grandma, grandpa, the student, the, the educators, the principal, because everyone wants to have a happy child. Yes. Everyone wants to have the children succeed. And the children themselves are so happy yes. because they have accomplished something that people say you couldn't do. Right. So they say, you know, little black boy, little black girl, you can't have a 4.0. Right. And the little black girl, little black boy, so watch me, watch me. Right. I heard recently someone said to a little black girl, you are, they use the term, low learner. Well, under the consent decree, if the child failed, the teacher failed. Yes. So I think we need to go back to that because we send our children to school to learn. And sometimes, uh, many, sometimes in our community, there's no one at home to help you. Yeah. We have young uh, mom and dad, they said to me, Mrs. Marshall, you know, I was never that good in school. 
So then we have to, we don't, we don't punish the parent. We step in and help the parent. We step in and help the child. So I have always figured that my job is just not in the classroom. If I had to raise funds to bury some child, I did. Yes. If I had to raise funds to have some, a one who's lost their home in a fire, I did. Yes. And then it's a great time for us was to send students to the HBCU fair. Yes. A tour. I were dying gray. I were Jackie Russian. And so during the day, we'll leave the classroom, we'll leave the office. And I have the ideas, but I'm not a good cook. <laughs> but I have educators who are good cooks. And we were fried a chicken and have all the sides. And we would make a lot of money to send students. Some students have never left San Francisco. Yes. So they will fly to Georgia and to Tennessee and see these HBCUs. And they will come back just so happy. Yeah. And so that's why I figured my job is just not, just not in the classroom, not in the office. I need to make sure that someone comes after me and keep doing these same kinds of things. And then, and I will love my parents. We have something now called the APAC, the African American Parent Advisory Council. And, and these are phenomenal parents. The first year was uh, at Leo Le Havre, where my office mm -hmm. was. And I was, I said, okay, I'm gonna come downstairs and see what they need. All I had to do was unlock the door and go back to the office. Because they planned the agenda. So if you, have, if you ever pass by school in the district and see a parking lot full of cars at six o'clock, you can bet your last penny is an APAC meeting. That's right. They have great agendas, great speakers, and delicious food and door prizes. And they always do book giveaways because we want our students to be able to read. So currently, they were saying that our students are not doing so well. Well, people forget that we had two years of COVID. Yes. Uh, a global pandemic where students could not come to school. And so they didn't learn, they learned as much as we wanted them to. So it's up to the district, it's up to the community yes. to make sure that we bring those, get, get those students what they need. It's tutoring, a tutor, or whatever you need. We need, we need to make sure we, whether you have children in school or not, we, you, you, you are doing great things with the students. And uh, I was just talking to your video videographer a moment ago. We said that was this is a skill that we can teach our children. So it's yes. all of us. Do, it's all of us doing together. Sorry, no, I went on and on. No, that's us. that's good. This is what this is about. It's a, yeah. it's a true genuine conversation. First, just want to say thank you for your service. You know, when we talk about public service, we talk about people giving back to the community. Um, definitely, you're that pillar. When you thank look you. into uh, that dictionary of persons persevering, doing things, that's just you. Thank and you. And I'm, I'm just always amazed the energy that you have and how connected that you are with our communities. But, you know, I want to hit back on a couple of things that you talked about. Um, you know, during the uh, pandemic, you know, a lot of things was exposed mm -hmm. um, and the disparities that expect, impacted black and brown youth. I mm -hmm. mean, the black community mm -hmm. hard. Um, as an educator, you know, 40 years in the city and just mm -hmm. looking at what's going on, um, where are our youth at? Because people are still... Um, asking that question here in San Francisco is about less than 5,000 students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we struggled in a number of areas of like having access to Wi-Fi to get on the Zoom mm -hmm. school, um, access to the materials, mm -hmm. uh, laptops and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But now that we've, we've kind of come out of the pandemic, what is some of the feel you're getting from mm -hmm. APAC or mm -hmm. from some of the organizations that's doing, mm -hmm. you know, specific intense work with our youth? We're, we're that spectrum of where we at with our young people? Well, I, I, you asked the question, kind of answered it somewhat as well, because we are less than 5%, 3% of the population, I kind of think it's really about five, but people say about three. And so that's reflective in our schools. You can go into any school between K-12 and maybe only see five African-American children. And of those five African-American children, many times they are not welcome. Yeah. The parents are not welcome. They are not treated very well. The little girl that I talked about earlier, she's in kindergarten, and the teacher said that she was a low learner. Mm. Well, I've chat to her about, I want to say, well, you know, this teacher needs to go. But I've learned to have a little bit more patience with that, because most of the time around, I would go into the schools together and talk to the principals and talk to the schools. So some days I go into schools when we have to go and meet with the parent and the principal recently. Then I tell, think to myself, it's amazing that our students can, can do anything yeah. because it's such an unwelcoming environment many right. times when we go to the schools. So some, most of the time the schools are dirty. You have to have a clean environment. Yes. And it's not welcoming and it's many times the administrators are new. In one school, everybody left, so they're all new. Right. So we just, that's why the community, the African-American community, 
every church has a fellowship hall like this, it is empty. So every church in the Fillmore, in the Outer Mission, in San Francisco, should have something during the, uh, during the day, in the afternoon, for students, yes. for parents. For, uh, in the Asian community, they have Saturday school. We used to have Saturday school. Under the, people have forgotten, under the consent decree, Dr. Martin Luther King Middle and Bergen were two of the top schools in the city and in the country. Right. We can go, we had, we had high standards. And we could be, I think, I think we need to create our own schools. Yes. We need to create our, create our own schools. We know what, we know that our students can learn. We know, we know great edu educators who are retired. And you don't have to be someone with a college degree. You can just be someone who's willing to teach somebody. Willing to teach someone how to change a tire. Willing to teach someone how to be a culinary person. Yes. There are so many great restaurants in the city. How many are owned by black people? Not a lot. Uh, there are, everyone has a car. Well, most people have a car. How do you change your tire? How do you do things? We sh everything that we need, we should have in our community. When people tell me that I wasn't here then, well, the Fillmore was just a vibrant place right down the street. There were black owned businesses and all that. We need to go back to that. So I saw something, some video recently where some young um, vendors, African American vendors, have a store right down the street and they have, they're all in there together so I need to stop by there and support them. And I was talking to Marcus Books and, um, over the weekend in Berkeley, I go, we do miss you. So we lost Marcus Books, however, someone else should have a bookstore and we need to support whatever, business, whatever black businesses there are, we need to support them and keep them there and then train the young people. Every black business should have some young people working. When I drive by all of these um, these uh, stores and companies and union halls, every union hall should be tied to a school. Yes. So that when a student finishes 12th grade, he or she can decide, yes, I'm gonna go to college. No, I'm not gonna go to college, but I have a skill already. Right. I learned how to type in my small hometown in Tennessee. Typing has served me my whole career. Yes. I used to teach, uh, they don't call it typing anymore, so everybody does the uh, texting, texting, <laughs> texting with two, 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 fingers, two fingers. However, every child needs to leave high school with a skill. Yes. They may never use it. They may use it in 20 years. It doesn't matter, but it's our responsibility as adults to teach them, to help them become productive citizens because they don't know, but they want to know. But that's what the whole community, what your program is doing, yes. the whole training programs, Oh, uh, Saturday school programs and pay the people, pay yes. the students. Yes. Many times that check that Johnny or Susie gets puts groceries on the table. Yes. And many times our students don't have enough food during COVID. We had these virtual board meetings. I'm always at a board meeting. And I was behind this uh, upper middle class Caucasian man. And he was so upset with the superintendent. Matthews. He says, I'm tired of you talking about this and that. I want my, my daughter in school. I wanted my daughter in school yesterday. So I came behind him. I said, sir, I appreciate the superintendent giving food to a bag of food for a week. You don't have to show that you're a district child. They, they did it at first, but they just left. Okay, everybody needs to eat. And he and I said, your daughter's not hungry. Her friends are not hungry. But there are many children who go to sleep, who go to bed hungry every night if it had not been for the superintendent's program to give food to everybody. So that's a basic need, food. Yes. And then computers, you mentioned it earlier. Unfortunately, in Baby Hunters Point, the internet, pro internet connect connectivity program was such an issue. How can you learn if you can't get online? Yes. And after two or three tries, even adults, we will get it. We can say, okay, I'm not going to be bothered with that anymore. So we need to work with that era. The, the district is working on that. And then currently, I'm so sad that we're a year in January or February that our district changed its payroll system and, young, and teachers are not being paid. Well, how can you live in one of the most expensive cities in the whole world and not get your paycheck? Mm -hmm. We have to camp out to get your paycheck and all those kinds of things. So we just some, a lot of things that we need to do to help each other. And we just have to support each other as a people. I am very proud of that young woman. At, oh, I guess it's 400 McAllister. No, Dr. is number one, Dr. Carlton B. Goodley plays because she shows us that no matter where you grew up, you can be, you can arise to the top. Now she's raised by her grandmother in public housing and look where she is now. Yes. The mayor of the city and county of San Francisco, one of the richest cities in the whole world. 
And so there are many issues in our city, but we need to just work together to support them. Yeah, definitely. I think that's great information and, um, you know, just well taken points. And like we said, the pandemic opened up all of the disparities, um, the food insecurity, the learning disparities, the health disparities, um, you know, the amount of people that's here in San Francisco. I think you touched on something that's really powerful that I've been really preaching. So I guess we align on this yeah. because I, I've really talked about um, because we have a small population of black folks in San Francisco and we are aware of the harm that the city has caused the black community um, through policy, through legislative measures, through development. There's been a number of ways we've been impacted. Um, one of the things that I feel because there is um, such a wealth gap, we, we learn how below um, black earners are in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. How do we empower our young people to stay motivated with school when some of our young people are trying to make income to help support mm -hmm. their families? Mm -hmm. How do we make for uh, paid um, schooling, like apprenticeship almost, but yeah. to go to school? Um, I'm, I'm there with you. I, yeah. I think there is so much money um, that we could utilize and take mm -hmm. from the city mm -hmm. um, to do that, that mm -hmm. every young person gets the opportunity to earn a stipend yeah, while they go to school to learn as an incentive, right? I because agree. it is so tough. I agree. Um, I agree. So I'm in line with you on that. But it's one of the things I, I want to ask you, and you could touch it or not, but you've hit on something that I'm also agreeing with um, on. There's so many communities who don't support um, black in all areas, yeah. business, education. Yeah. Um, and you kind of talked about it, how do we do our own? Yeah. Now, when you say that, some people get offended. I've talked to elders and they go, hey, segregation is what, you know, mess things up or, G re you know. So on that yeah. um, realm, just want to ask you, how do you really feel about all black schools, right? Because I've watched so much data and people say, hey, black kids, they're brilliant. They thrive when they have black teachers. They thrive when they have black yeah. principals. They yeah. thrive when they see all black. Yeah. Um, they learn better. They understand the concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where are you at on that spectrum? Because some people get offended when I ask that. I go, should we go back to all black schools? And, and I get a lot of pushback. I, yes, we should. <laughs> yes, we should. Yes, we should. I am an alum of Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. Lane College is an HBCU. I had the most caring, nurturing professors on that campus. So it gave me the foundation to, to go on to Boston University. It gave me the foundation to come to, come to San Francisco and get my degrees here at SF State. But you, you can't learn in an environment that's hostile to you. Yes. You can't, you can't. Many times our students will go to schools in the west side of town, they live in Bayview Hunters Point, they take the bus there, and they don't feel welcome. When I go into the buildings, I don't feel welcome. So how can you learn in a hostile environment where someone makes you feel that you don't belong there? Yes. The public schools, they are public schools for every child who lives in the city and county of San Francisco. No matter where you live, they, I think they're gonna go back to all. Um, Z zip code zoning in two years, mm -hmm. um, I am opposed to that. Okay. I think parents should have a right to put their child in any school they want to. If someone wants to drive 30 minutes to take the kid to school, what they think perceive to be a better school, do it. If every school in the district has what every school in the west side of town have, and they do not on the, on the east side, then we can go into zip code schools. Right. But if, if if my child is in a school, school in Baby Hunters Point, and he or she can't get on the, on the, on the computer, that's already a dean. Right. If my child is in Baby, in a Baby Hunters Point school, and it's April, and they haven't had a math, credential math teacher the whole year, that's already a dean. Right. If my child is in Baby Hunters Point, there's a sub every other day for language arts, they already have a dean. So if every school is equal to a Lowell, I don't like Lowell either. <laughs> okay. I don't like Lowell. I don't like Lowell. We support the BSU there. And we support the students there. And I've gone there a lot with Reverend Brown and my former supervisor, Hula, Hula Lydell. And one day, uh, I guess about five years ago, we, every time we hear the BSU calls us, we go as a community. So they called and they said they were having some issues at, at Lowell. So we went, Reverend Brown and I went over, and Hula Lydell and I, my supervisor, we went over and we listened to their stories. So we said, okay, we'll have a, a, a town hall on Sunday afternoon for two hours. With the stories they told us, my heart is still broken about the experiences at Lowell. So instead of a two hour, so two hours is not enough. 
We said, okay, we'll come back on Monday afternoon for another hour, another two hours of all of these horrific stories. They, get a, they do get a good education there. However, they're not, they don't feel welcome. One little girl said, one young lady said, well, if I sit beside this Asian boy, uh, young man, he thinks I'm cheating, so he does like this. Thinks that I'm going to look at his paper. She said, well, I got in school just like, you know, I have the, the aptitude to, to be here just like you do. So they were not only mistreated by their teachers, didn't feel welcome, but also many of the students felt that, felt that they should not be there. Or they got in on the, or the system and say, okay, if you come from certain schools and baby hunters point, you, have, you, can, you get more points to, to come here. And so now some parents, some APAC parents said to us at the, at the board meeting about a month ago that many Asian, not some Asian parents are enrolling their kids in Willie Brown because Willie Brown is an anchor school too old. And they're taking those seats away from black students who may want to go there. And so I'm opposed to that too, because I think that a black, until, until every black child in this, in this district has equal opportunity, then it's no, the, 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 the playing uh, of the yeah. ground is not yet level, it is not fair. So we gotta be fair, and it's up to the black community to make sure it's fair. But in the meantime, every, every fellowship hall, <laughs> Every so should have a program for students, yes. including including us here, yes. right here. Yes, we should have something on Saturday. Uh, I think every child in kindergarten should be learning a foreign language. Well, what can, why can't they learn it after school? Yes, why can't they learn it after school? So and then and take them to. We live in the San Francisco, where everyone should be going to the theater. They should be going to live theater. I remember once at Galileo, I took some students to the theater. And then this young lady said, she said, I thought this was just for rich people. She lived right there on Fulton Street. She could look mm -hmm. out her door and see City Hall, but never mm -hmm. been there. So if we don't take the students who will. Right. Who would do that? So every student, before we're trying to get our fifth grade, should be, have gone to a live theater. Yes. Every middle school student should have a mentor, a mentor mm -hmm. and a high school student. Every high school student should, be, should have a trade or vocation that they can do in case they choose not to do, go to college. Yeah. And every student should leave fifth grade knowing a foreign language. Yes. And being able to read and write at grade level before you get out of first grade. Yes. Third grade is too late. Right. So you said to me that you can start school in preschool, you go to preschool a couple of years, kindergarten, first grade, second, third, six years in school, you still can't read. Well, that's not the child's yes. fault. That's, just, that's, it, that's the teacher's fault. Right. That's the education system's fault. And then why we have to put our students, the black kids in special ed? Right. You're you saying to me that as a mother now grandma, that my child can only learn as, as a special ed student, not against special ed. Because right. if a child needs speech therapy, sure. If a child needs some pull out services, sure. But why we have to put our kids in special ed for them to learn? What is it, what is it in the classroom environment that's not conducive for our right. students? So that's, that's a big question that we need to look into as a, as a community, as but in the community. meantime, we can do it ourselves. <laughs> yes, man, you see, uh, this is why this is a great conversation with Virginia Marshall, great insight. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk, because I know you oppose on some things, you force some things, and this is great because it's the generation gap and I'm always throwing stuff out there, um, but what do you think about the community schools um, the charter schools and then the prep schools like Rice Prep and Bayview is doing such a phenomenal job mm. um, but it's very limited mm. uh, to how we get people and I just want to hear from you do you think mm. those are the models we need to take the mm. community schools how do we engage uh, or how do we transform this public school institution mm. I am not opposed to charter school again I believe parents need choices so I'm not opposed to charter schools I, I I firmly believe in public schools. However, I think that if a parent sees a charter school as a great some, for, somewhere for their child to go and thrive, let them, let them go. Uh, I think I saw the Rise kids, I think at the G Young one day of uh, there, that's a small group of students. So I'm not opposed to charters. Charters do, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to them, but I think that we need to make sure every public school has what parents need. Yes. in order to have a successful child. Now, I didn't know that, because uh, my kids were all grown, and I was, I'm, high school, I'm a high school person. So I didn't know a few years ago that they changed the, um, the uh, you have to be six years old before you can start kindergarten. Well, they have a whole generation of kids, they, they, they created something called transitional, transitional kindergarten. So the district had 30 of those classes this past year. 
So we got ready to, oh, this is a personal because we got ready to roll my granddaughter and I go, she was born in November. I go like, wait, she can't help that she was born in November. I mean, she has to stay a whole nother year in kindergarten. So I went to just board me and I said, well, you didn't tell us that a child will be 30 years old by the time they get out of kindergarten, <laughs> which is unfair, right? I so said, now instead of an 18-year-old, you can have a whole bunch of kids who are 19. Hmm. So I, I go, so what did, what did the extra year do for the child in pre-K? Nothing that I can see. Hmm. So now they're going to change it back. But in the meantime, you have some kids who are caught in there, caught into this, Cycle, that yeah. they're, 19, they're going to be 19 in the 12th grade because they have the extra year in pre-K. And what do they do there? Nothing yeah. that I can see that. So I, I think that whatever, between January 1 and December 30th or 31, for that year that you turn five, you should be allowed to go to kindergarten, unless your parents say, no, I think my journey Susan needs to stay another year. I think, I guess we just, parents have choices. Yeah. And we don't, we don't, we just don't value our parents enough. And we don't appreciate them enough. And as I said, when I go into schools now, I feel so sad. I really feel sad because um, it's just such a, so much negativity toward our students there. And the staff do not feel welcome there. So most of the staff, they're having issues too with their principals or, or it's just, it's just, I, as I said, when I left school one day, I go like, how do we ever learn anything with the, given this environment? I don't know. Yeah. I just don't know. So, so when you see those four point O's of the African American on a roll, stand up and cheer. Yes. When you yes. see all those kids come from grades three to twelve, stand up and cheer because they have made it. Yes. They are doing some great things. So when we see students, we just have to say to them, "You are smart. You are brilliant." And I'm so proud of you. Yes. And we just have to help them. Help them. If, every, if everybody would just mentor a child, if every person would just mentor a, a, a school, it would just be so much better. Yeah, definitely. I just definitely want to give um, a congratulations to you and all the people who made um, the honor roll event at Keysar this year. I was yeah. there. Yeah, and uh, even with the small amount of the 30, 40 youth, yeah. um, it's just very powerful. Yeah. Young kids going to Berkeley, young kids yeah. excelling. Yeah. Um, there are a tremendous amount of young African American students who are excelling in this school district. Mm -hmm above all of yeah. the obstacles and, and, and things that they have to deal with mm -hmm. not being welcomed in community. Mm -hmm. But want to transition the conversation a little bit um, before we get into the last final part, but wanted to get into, you know, you talked a lot about community and leadership and what, you know, the black community looked like when you first came here. There's been a lot of transition mm -hmm. in San Francisco, mm -hmm. a lot of gentrification, mm -hmm. a lot of tech companies, a lot of different cultures coming to the city. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to you, and this is something I always talk about, right? When I talk about the elders and the young people, we are here at both sides of the conversation. We're always trying to build, bridge the gap between the young and the old. Mm -hmm. uh, but there seems to be a disconnect with mm -hmm. the young people and the elders of the community. And one mm -hmm. of the things that I'm always trying to find out is how do we pass the torch? Mm -hmm. How do we get the elders, uh, the people not only in the pool pit, but our community leaders, our community organizations, mm -hmm. There's a big trouble in our community mm -hmm. um, with passing the leadership over mm -hmm. so that the young generation can move forward. Now, That's we all as community know our young people are the future. Yeah. They are the ones. Yeah. But when you look at the black community, particularly, um, the dynamics of that transition is mm -hmm. so slow. Mm -hmm. It's very you know, dragged out. Yeah. And I feel like that's part of why we're not moving as community okay. fast enough with other communities. But I wanted to hear your perspective of, mm. and you, from your lived experience, being around a number of community folks, here at both sides of the conversation, we're always trying to bridge the gap between our young people and the elders of the community. Um, but in our community, it seems to be a real challenge of our elders to pass the torch to the young people to move our community forward and other cultures, other communities. Um, they seem to get the young people more involved with civil service, things of that nature, and get them involved um, with policies and how to organize and mobilize community. Mm -hmm. um, so from your perspective, just want to hear um, from you, what do you think about that? I mean, I know you a pillar in the community around a lot of uh, mm -hmm. the different community leaders and folks, but from your perspective, how do we make that transition? Do you believe it's a problem? I don't know if it's a problem per se. I think that some people are transitioning in like over a period of two years. I did it in one year. However, what I found though, that many young people, I feel that I owe people who help me uh, respect forever and appreciation forever. 
And I'm finding, though, that when we turn the ch pass the torch to the young people, some of them, was, uh, one person said, I don't know the person in the position before me, nothing. Well, that's a bad attitude. That's, so we're not going to thrive that way. So I think the young people who transitioned into these positions that the elders have had for decades, perhaps, I think we need to, they need to be more appreciative to the elder. Then I also think what we did in the alliance was we need to do term limits. Like some presidents were there for five years, 10 years, that's too long. So what we did is say, okay, you can do two two-year terms and then you gotta go, no matter how good you think you are. You, know, you always think you're good and most people think you are, right? Mm -hmm. And so perhaps we need to do that in the community. If you are a director of a center, uh, maybe you just need to do five there, five years. And then on the fourth year, you're training someone to take your place. Mm -hmm. However, when you train someone to fill the, on the fourth year to take your place, you out in the fifth year of uh, fifth year, and you out the sixth year, the person who's taking your place owes uh, you don't they don't just 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 be respectful of the person, you know, mm -hmm. just be respectful and and appreciate what they did, and not try to outdo them, but bring, but but have your own legacy to make it better. So I think that perhaps we need to do term limits. I know there are some people who are transitioning now because it's a two-year transition. That's a little bit too long, I think, in my, in my personal opinion. So I think we need to do term, uh, term limits, and then young people need to be, show appreciation and not talk negatively about the person who's what position you took. Uh, no, do those. Just, just, be, just be appreciative. Be kind. Yeah. Be nice. Because at some point, you're going to transition over to, to, the, to the next generation. And so I, I, th I think that's what we need to do as a, as, as, as a people. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective. I mean, you know, I work with a lot of the young people, um, and I've done my community work in there, and I just feel like, you know, in a lot of realms that yeah. our elders are dying off with the information, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So they hold on, and sometimes it's ego, yeah. sometimes we just don't know. Yeah. Or maybe there's a bunch of people standing by on the side of us, not yeah. really telling us, hey, yeah. it's time to, to, to pass it on. I yeah. mean, you see it in the political parties. Yeah. It's these people who've been around for a long time. And yeah. it's like, yeah. not that they don't have the great message, maybe they, not that they have the experience and the knowledge, mm -hmm. but they, it's, it's like it becomes stale. It's oh, yeah. not, it's not yeah. energized, yeah. right? Yeah. And one of the things we want to do is keep our communities mobilized, oh, yeah. energized, keep yeah. it fresh, yeah. new perspectives. But again, I think the respect thing is um, very important. Mm -hmm. But I hear young people say that a lot. And the, and the reason why I ask is because we go to these events, we're in the community, and I see it, yeah. right? I'm big on trying to let the young people speak. Yeah. Some of the folks that I know uh, do a really good job at letting the young people speak. Okay. But then it's like, sometimes the people who have that power, that oh, yeah. authority, yeah. or have that yeah. type of public figure, yeah. They don't let the young people oh, speak, yeah, yeah. right? We do these That's events, fair. and That's it's fair. all of these elders speaking, yeah. all of these adults speaking, and the young people, and the young people stand over there, and they like, this is why there. we don't want to get involved, yeah. right? Yeah. So when we talk there. about bridging that gap, yeah. right? It's like, yeah. how do we intentionally put something together yeah. to where, one, the respect that you're talking mm -hmm. about, the appreciation mm -hmm. that we train our young people yeah. up, yeah. so that they understand this is what yeah. they were working on this mm -hmm. is how long it takes to develop yeah. you know how do we put that together and, and make it a smooth transition yeah. where it's transparent for everyone yeah we just i think we have to have a conversation maybe we just need to have a conversation with the leaders it's like you know what is your what's your plan so i do think a two-year plan a two-year transition is too long i think it could be done in a year but i'm very adamant about the young people not trying to do the person that you a position you took Oh, you know, and, and, just, and just be respectful, just be kind, you know, because you need it, because it should be a constant transition, transition. Right. And then I thought about when you were talking, we, I don't know who's doing the, the Dr. M.L. King breakfast anymore. You know, right. we used to have it for years, right. and I, I don't know who's doing it, so that could be, that could be a, a way for young people to, that could be an event that 30-year-olds right. could put together and have yes. and do. So I, th I think the 30-year-olds need to, uh, um, some, some, someone called them the, jo the Joshua generation, uh, I think they need to come, just put, do some events. Yeah. Just, from bit, bit, just, we just come as to support. Right. And uh, we ask, you know, if you need some, or have a question, you call, or call us up or email us or come by and say, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? But just, to, I think young people, I, I think January is not, it's not very far. Right. I, th I, th I think that, I think that would be a good way but you know, for something for young people to do. And I think they just need to start doing events completely on their own. 
yeah. and use us as support. Right. Oh, that's definitely, that's huge. I think that's yeah. something we could definitely put out there, yeah. making sure that the funding and the resources yeah. get yeah. to the young people so that they can plan and put mm -hmm. it together mm -hmm. and invite our seniors. Yeah. You know, I'm just really all about finding that way because I, yeah. I, I know um, the wisdom, yeah. the patience that our elders have, yeah. you know, our young folks, they're ambitious, they oh, going, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But we need to put the two together because yeah. I think to really transform mm. the black community, when we talk about changing the narrative, mm. right? We want to change that stereotype of yeah. our elders hold on too long, yeah. our young people don't want to get involved. Yeah. It's some mis-disconnect, oh, but we yeah. have to bring them together yeah. in the middle yeah, to really make sure yes, absolutely. that we're moving our communities absolutely. forward. And I, I, I met you on the King Reverend. I know Reverend Grizel does a lot of things on, the, on that day. So I don't want to take anything away from what, he, well, I think he does a luncheon. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to take anything away from what he does. But I, I think there's still, there still a need there. Yeah. Uh, and so Black Christmas is coming up. One of the young people plan, so they could do something for Dr. King's uh, birthday. You could do something, they could do something to, for doing Black History Month from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. and, and then just, just make that, what, I mean, what, this, we talk about breakfast and luncheons, they may, well, they, their mindset might be on something else. Yes. I don't know. Right. You know, but just something, you know, lead the march. Right. And wouldn't it be nice if you saw a, uh, 500 young people leading the march? Yeah. And lead it every, lead it every year? You know? I, I think that's very important. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the conversations, too, that needs to be had is I talk to the young people, mm -hmm. and I know um, we're both very into our spirituality, yeah. our religion, yeah. um, but from the pandemic, a lot yeah. of the young people are feeling disconnected oh, from yeah. the church. And oh, I know yeah. you talked about earlier they don't, they don't how, yeah, yeah, they talked about how the churches need to have more educational yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, when we grew up, the churches were the pillar yeah. of our communities. Yeah. Those were the places for resources. Mm -hmm. You know, over time, things have developed, things mm -hmm. have happened. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a big disconnect oh, with our it, churches it, and our it, young oh, people. Oh, oh, it absolutely is. I mean, our church, oh, for Sunday, most times, youth Sunday. As I, we have, I, we have, Two teenagers and four kids. That's all because half our half our members still choose to do Zoom. Yes. And half of them still come. So if you have half your population doing Zoom, well, you know you're not gonna have too many people there. Right. Now I looked at another church yesterday. They had a guest speaker, and I looked at up when they pan the church. I go, oh, there's nobody there. So you know, so so and then I think COVID. What thing? What thing? COVID taught us that for two years we didn't wear those church clothes. So which means we came at the church just like this. And so young people don't want to put on all that stuff. So just come as you are. You know, just, uh, I think if the young people just come, just come to church and say, okay, you know, just come, just come. And then, and then have a Sunday for, again for them to do. No, no, not just sit down. Just we just sit back and let them do. Let them, let them yeah. do. Let them do the whole. Let them do the. Let them do the sermon. Yeah. Let them do all the things that go along with that. You know, yeah. because, because because it's training. My grand had two granddaughters sitting down there, and I go like, they're just sitting here. Yeah. I can't sing past the. Right. But I started a young people's choir. Right. So they know four songs right now, and if I do do, if I say say it loud, they know how to go. I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> right. So, so 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 because they were just sitting there. Yes. And I saw I go like, okay, we got to do something. And then some, I, I was talking to Dr. Davis. I, I also wanted to turn this fellowship up into some music lessons for them, yes. and, and, and not just them, but the community for the community. So you, whatever your vision is, you just got to make it happen. And so for the young people, you know, go to, talk to your pastor. Yeah. I think all pastors will be receptive to having young people come and do whatever they want to do in the church. And if you don't come here, come here. We're, we're glad to have young people come. We'd be glad to sit and watch because it's, it's a blessing to sit back and watch young people do their thing. Yes. And lead. Yes. You know, it's just a blessing. I've been blessed over the years to have been around some great, phenomenal young people. Phenomenal young people. And many coming from horrific home, homes, but yes. they still were able to lead. Yes. And they're still able to lead. And I've seen them do some great, some great things. And I've seen some fathers who raise their children all by themselves. Right, right, right. Some grandmas who raise their kids all by themselves. And so some kids who are uh, doing it all uh, three years ago before COVID, some of uh, the ROTC kids were protesting and they were coming and the judicial was not kind to them. They would make them sit there for hours and call them at the end. Then the kids have to get up and take the bus home. So I said to a district one day, you know, what if these kids treated you like you treated them? There'll be a ride in here. Let the kids go first. 
They got to get on the bus and go home. I said, look at these other middle class mom and dads here. They can put their kids in the car and drive them back, most likely the west side of town. Let the kids go first after the hour or so, whatever you got to do, so they can go home. Yeah. So we just have to treat everybody the way we want to be treated. Yeah. And many times our leaders and students are taking a the bus. They're taking two buses. Right. So we just, we just have to always do the, go the extra step to help young people always yeah i think that's the the motto and i think that's kind of the voice of the young people um and definitely i've been saying it on my show we have to reset yeah. right we, yeah. we everybody's yeah. at z we have to just start back yeah. at the basic but yeah. definitely um there's some changes that need to happen not only in our churches and our communities mm -hmm. our schools and mm -hmm. i think it does start with opening up with new minds mm -hmm. new understanding i think you hit a great point you know young people just be able to come to church how they are yeah. right if we're really talking about the message yeah. and what you come to get mm -hmm. that welcoming spirit that yeah. you talked about we want our young people to feel welcome yeah. so absolutely yeah. absolutely because other, other than that when we die off who's going to take our place yeah when we die off i said well unfortunately i have known some transitions and the transition and go to well on behalf of the young people because they were they said, you know, I don't know, I don't know the person anything, right. you know, and it was always like, you know, I want to do better than you. Well, don't have that mindset. Create your own, create your, create your own legacy. That's right. Create your own legacy, but never be disrespectful to an elder. That's right. If you don't agree with what they're saying, just go, go like, okay, you know, thank you. And, but well, this is what I think, yes. you know, but not, but not disrespect. Yes. And you always owe somebody. If you, t if you take it, sit in that chair with someone else sat, you owe that person something. Yes. Or nothing else but respect and, and being, being appreciated. Yeah, I think that's very powerful. Yeah. So with that being said, this has been a very inspirational, powerful conversation for me. A lot of insight from you. This is why these conversations are so important to me because you know you have been that trailblazer. You have Thank been you. Um, building this legacy. I mean, Thank and all you. the work when people say Virginia Marshall, everybody knows it. You're just a <laughs> light, right? We just you show up in all spaces and places representing the people. So just wanted to say thank you. But before we go, one final question um, that I wanted to ask you because we are about changing the narrative. We are trying to make sure um, that the resources, the information, the things that our community need, we could be a part of that. Um, because again, we understand that there's so many things that take place. And there's a lot of people who feel like, hey, John, the support is not there. The resources are not in the community. What we need is not there. And their voices, um, they feel like they're not heard, right? Mm -hmm. So here at both sides of the conversation, we want to amplify our voices. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that the community, the people who are listening, tuning in, they know what yeah. was out there. So if they have a resource or when we advocate, because as community, we are always advocating and trying to make sure that our people get the things that they need to be impactful. Mm -hmm. And that's part of that narrative shift process. And I just think even for us, right, we like, all we do um, here at both sides of the conversation is, is, is mainly about analyzing, right? Criticizing and mobilizing. That's what I kind of figure, okay. right? That's what we're doing. Like we just go around and we analyze situations. We criticize the situations when they don't work. We try to figure out the solution and then we mobilize, right? We get the people. We find great people like you. We work with other organizations. We like, hey, this is what's needed. Let's go make it happen. Um, but with that being said, um, as a retiree um, here in the city, um, you've seen the changes, but now at your retiree stage, um, just your day-to-day -day living, um, can you just say some of the things that you feel as an elder of the community, things that you feel like programming should be there, what support is needed? Um, we know that our, with our elders, there's a big technical and, mm -hmm. and technology gap. I've talked to a couple of the senior citizens, and they're like, hey, we need some kids to come down here and teach our kids, yeah. our elders, how to get on Facebook and how yeah. to connect. Yeah. So, you know, just want to take a minute just while everybody's listening, just what do you think as um, far as support that's needed for our elders, how to engage our elders, mm -hmm. anything that you would like to see more connectivity with okay. the seniors of the okay. community? Okay, well, first, I'm enjoying my retirement, <laughs> but my family said, Mom, you should stay on payroll because you're not really retired. But I enjoy two days a week, I do grandma car carpool days. And that's really very enjoyable for me to pick up, take my grandkids to school and pick them up. And then one has early release, they have to go back an hour later and get the other two. So, so, that's, so, that's, so that's okay. And then I saw something, from, I think it was from Booker T, saying for seniors, come, and if you, whatever questions you have that your child may not have the patience to answer, come and we'll answer it. I'm going to go to that class, you know, because you have me put well, an icon before we got started with this, with this interview. So I think the technology part, the technology part is what we need, because many times our children are, don't have the patience, or the grandkids may be too small or whatever, mine, mine are small. But I, I, think, I think the technology part is, is great. Then also joy. Yeah. Seniors need joy. I'm blessed that I have 
an extended family here. But there are a lot of seniors who will probably live in a senior citizen home who don't have anyone to talk to, yeah. or don't have anyone. So just some, some appreciations, you know, so on, on Thanksgiving, make sure that every senior in the building got, oh, I had a hot meal. Yeah. Uh, when somebody's in the hospital, send them, a, send them a get well card. You can't go visit, send them a get well card. So I, I, I just think reaching out to the seniors and in, in, in the senior citizens home uh, in the local churches and I think keep doing what you're doing to reach out with, for the technology part. And then someday just do something fun. Yeah. Whenever time I pass by the Fillmore Center, you know, right there, right by Fort Sheba's, that little area there, the yeah, round yeah, circle, yeah, yeah. I go like, now wouldn't it be a nice place for a dance party? Right. <laughs> you know, the people just out there dancing and you have some food and you're just having fun. You know, yes. just having just, every time on Juneteenth, I just have, I said, I have to sit there and eat my, eat my, whatever I'm going to eat that day. Because I think that space is just, to me, that space is just very inviting. Yes. It's just very inviting. And then we have lost a lot of facilities in our community. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Rosales. Yeah. You know, we, we, we've lost a lot of places that we used to go and, and the restaurants on this side of town. And so just, uh, just give, just give. Christmas is coming up. Make sure every senior has food. Yeah. Give them a little present. You know, uh, then I, it would be nice to have elementary kids go and read them. You know, for, for a while we couldn't get to touch, you know, too close for yeah. seniors and the elementary kids and all there. But wouldn't it be nice for the elementary students to go and read to a senior? Yeah. Or the seniors go read to an elementary kid. Yeah. You know, uh, the seniors go to a kindergarten or pre-K class and be the, be the grandma, the grandpa there. Yeah. You know, so it's just, it's just, we just need, we have their, their ideas. We just need to implement those ideas and then have that big dance party in the field. Board. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There you have it. What a great feedback. I think that is great for the community. You know, we here in San Francisco, um, in the Bay Area, where there's a lot of technology. And I hope people out here hear this. I mean, because I've heard this from a number of our elders of the community. They really want to learn the technology and things so that they can connect with uh, community. So here's a great idea. We have all these young entrepreneurs <laughs> out here. Start up a program where you could come in, but you have to have patience, yeah. right? You have to be able to be nice and respectful. <laughs> and then you can come in and teach our elders how to get on the internet, yeah. how to check their email, yeah. how to send text messages, how to do all of this. Uh, uh, social media stuff so they connect. Um, but I think also um, one of the powerful things that you stated about feeling connected, and I think we all could do this as community as we are approaching the holiday season to make sure that our elders do have food and they yeah. do have some kind of um, gifts and things to make them feel part of the community. Yeah. And, you know, COVID, a lot of folks have lost family members. Mm -hmm. And as well as just in, in our community centers, how do you, your organization, we always talk about bridging the gap of the young people. How do we get our young people to come and yeah. dance with the elders, yeah. come play dominoes with the yeah. elders, come have conversations with the elders? Yeah. I think this is what we should be planning. Uh, but to all of the people out there watching, you've got a lot of information from Ms. Virginia Marshall. <laughs> this is why she is our senior <laughs> highlight that we're talking about. This, the narrative shift, right? This is so powerful. Um, but you touched on so many things today, and we just thank you, thank um, you, you know, for the time. We just appreciate um, you. And, and part of this is about giving the flowers to, I appreciate you know, at, at both I sides of the conversation. It. That respect you're talking about, you. that's I the respect. You, John. And I want you to know, John, you have this high energy. You're always glad to see me, and you make me feel so good. Yes. And I really appreciate you. Yes. And just tell your parents they raise a good son. Thank you. Because, you know, it's true, we are reflect children are a reflection of their parents. And so you, if we just need to clone you so that you, so when elders, we see some young person, they're, 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 they're like you. Because everyone wants to feel appreciated and loved. That, that's all. There you guys go. You heard it from Virginia Marshall. I'm going to be selling my DNA now. We're going to clone. Most simplicity of John Henry. But again, no, I seriously just want to say thank you uh, from all your work. And yes, I always... Um, embrace your energy when you come mm -hmm. onto our mega black calls. Oh, yeah. You always just bring down information, make sure the community is informed. Thank and we you. just really appreciate your advocacy and the work Thank that you. you do for our young people in education. Education is so important yeah. to our young black families. And yeah. we know uh, we deal with so much in our community mm -hmm. from PTSD, mm -hmm. mental health, different things that. Yeah. Um, you know, just plague us in our community. And we just want to thank you You're to welcome. all of the educators out there because I think <laughs> we want to uplift that. We just want to yeah. praise all of our educators. Yeah. Shout out to all our APAC families, yeah. Letitia Irvin, yeah. and all of those That's phenomenal women over yeah. there 
and they continue yeah. uh, to put education on the forefront. And we want to thank, um, thank you. Director Davis for yes, her continued work absolutely. to make sure that our community gets the books, absolutely. the information. Absolutely. Thank you to our mayor, London Breed. Yes. Um, you know, our board president, Siobhan Walton, yes. all of the amazing folks that continue to impact. This is the first yes. time we've had black leadership yes. of this letter yes. level in our city. Yes. And um, there is impact happening. You are one of those folks. I would say you're one of our hidden gems, but you're not so <laughs> hidden. Everybody know Virginia Marshall now. Um, but thank you for this conversation. Welcome, I think this was um, very um, important. We're going to definitely take some of the points that you talked about and really figure out, you know, how do we mobilize forward and how we do we bring this to our community? Thank you, John. You are you absolutely are a leader. You are a leader. I so said we do need to clone you so young people can see you. And you mentioned those four leaders, starting with Amir Bree. You know, I call Amir Bree my daughter. So you are my son. Shimon is my son. And we want to thank Director Davis because yes. the impact of Mega Black has been all over the city. Yes. I love, the, I keep saying it all the time, I love the Thursday meetings because right. I'm listening to various groups throughout the city who are doing great things. Yes. They're doing young people, young people doing great things. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm inspired. I'm, I'm inspired. So that's yeah. what we need. It keeps us going. So yes, thank you, thank you to all of the DKI mm -hmm. uh, folks, Dr. Sai, all of yeah. other, that leadership, all of the community folks from yeah. the Human Rights Commission that continue to get involved in the community. Stephanie, it's just a number oh, of yeah. them that oh, do a yeah. phenomenal job. Jessica, a number of them. Yeah. And um, this is what it's all about. And, um, you know, we're continuing to push the dream forward. We yeah. are continuing to do the work. When we yeah. talk about equity in this city, yeah. we are continuing to do our part to bring equity. And here at both sides of the conversation, we're going to continue to do our part to lift the voices of the black folks, okay? We want to make sure the story is being told from our voices. <laughs> yeah. Our slogan is changing the narrative from our voices. We don't want to hear from everybody else. I want to hear from the Virginia yeah. Marshall and all of the other phenomenal folks in nice. our community. Nice. So thank you again You're for giving welcome. up this time, well, blessing you. our people with the information, and we love you. Thank you. For that love you, John. Love you, John. Right, thank you for taking the time yes. to do me. It's been wonderful. Yes. This will be a highlight of my, of my yes. life. You're, you are very good. You're very, you're very, very good at what you're good here. You're good behind the scenes. So hey, I'm a good team. Yes, there we go. And thanks out. Most definitely before we leave, shout out to our both sides of the conversation team, to yeah. all the Dream Dreamkeeper Initiative grantees and all the folks that's continuing to make uh, the work that's going on happen. And shout out to my guys, Side and Tunes. Man, y'all know big man. Marco Williams putting it down. Check out Silent Tunes. Yeah, he's the one behind catching all of the great stuff that's going on in the community. So shout out to him. Thank y'all for tuning in today. Both sides of the conversation. Ah, uh, Shay. Another person blessed. That's what we do. Continue to bless the people.